so good morning everyone and uh, welcome to this plenary lecture named after Professor Vic Barnett. Um, my name is Marion Scott and I have the honour of uh, chairing this session. Um, as I said, these lectures are named after Professor Vic Barnett, who was instrumental um, in the growth and recognition of environmental statistics and what statisticians can bring to our understanding of the environment. Um, he was instrumental in the setting up of the environmental statistics section of the Royal Statistical Society. He set up, and for a number of years, um, was the, the key uh, figure in an organisation called Spruce, of which I had the, the honour to be one of the trustees. And shortly before Vic's death in 2014, um, the trustees met with him and discussed what we should do with our um, funding, our finances. And we decided that it would be highly appropriate to ask the Royal Statistical Society to manage um, and deliver, effectively, a Barnet Lecture um, annually. And we are very much delighted with the prestige of the winners of the Barnet um, Award. And this year we have Professor Peter Guttorp, who's standing in front of you here, rearing to go. So Peter is um, an emeritus professor at the University of Washington, where he's been since 1980. He's well known for his development of statistical methodology in diverse areas of environmental statistics. Um, he has students and collaborators around the world. He's well known for his communication of statistical results, not just to us, but to the wider world as well. He's currently a professor at the Norwegian Computing Centre, working on a diverse set of projects in climate science. He's a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the Institute for Mathematical Statistics, and has received numerous awards for his work. And this is just one um, in terms of uh, sig significance in a statistical sense of the award today um, to him for the Barnet Lecture. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Peter and to offer him the floor to give us his Barnet Lecture. So, Peter. We wrote a paper with this title. And, of course, it didn't get published with that title. Um, I still like it. So decision-making under, under uncertainty. Are you sure you want to do this? And, of course, you're not. And so we're going to go through a case study about how one can, one can argue um, using different kinds of uncertainty and, and, and uh, try to... Uh, come up with, with a way of deciding when to start adapting against, uh, against sea level rise. I first ran into Vic um, at the ISI meeting in Florence long ago, um, late 80s, I think, where I gave a talk on... on um, on, let's see, non-stationary covariance models. And Vic was very skeptical when he introduced me. He was the session chair. Uh, he said he didn't think anybody could do that. So, And then I gave my talk, and he hemmed and hawed a little, and then said, well, that looks really good. Um, I don't know. Um, I was a little taken aback, being a um, not very senior researcher, and, and uh, having my research commented on by the session chair was not something I had encountered before. Um, but I got him back, because uh, several years later, he and Tony O'Hagan wrote a book on um, how to set environmental standards. And you write a book, and uh, people review it. 
Well, he didn't just have people review it. He had a three-day workshop in Edinburgh with probably about two dozen people going through the manuscript line by line. I don't know how he survived those three days. <laughs> At the end, both he and Tony looked very tired. But uh, I thought that was very brave. Um, Vic, of course, was, was running Spruce at the same time I was running Ties, and at the same time uh, the ISI was thinking about starting an environment se section, and um, both Vic and I thought it would be a waste to have a third organization uh, that would be an international organization doing, doing environmental research. Um, but Vic wanted his group, and I wanted my group to be the, um, the um, international uh, environmental group. And, and um, it was a little difficult to, to agree, but eventually we started having each of the societies get sessions in the other societies' meetings, and, and we got along reasonably well uh, over the years. So I'm very honored. I'm pleased to uh, be giving this talk in memory of, of Vic Barnett. So, this is joint work with um, my colleague uh, Thordis Thorarn's daughter and, at Norwegian Computing Center, uh, and also Martin Drew um, from the Danish Technical University, and Karina de Bruin from uh, Cicero and, and uh, um, and from, from the Netherlands. It was funded by, um, by the Nordic um, uh, research um, funding organization, Nordforsk. Um, okay, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to start about talking about how you can project. So project, that's a technical word that climate scientists use uh, to talk about when you try to run a scenario and, and see how the world is going to look in the future. It's not a prediction because we're not predicting all the social changes that are going to, going to happen. And, 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 but we are writing down a scenario that includes some of those changes and then we're running our projections based on that scenario as being the truth. So we're going to project global sea level rise, and I'm going to do, show you a statistical tool to do that. Um, then we're going to project local sea level rise, which is not the same as global, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that's the case. We're going to project how much more expensive uh, sea level inundation event is going to be under higher sea level. And then we're going to look at what components of uncertainty are most important in this analysis. So let's start with uh, sea level rise. Here's uh, two pictures. Um, the top one is uh, the sea level rise since the last glacial period. So you see the end of the glacial period, there's, there's increases, and then there's a rapid increase, which is called Pulse 1A. And that's generally thought to be because a big chunk of the Antarctic uh, melted. And then it keeps increasing about 120 meters in all uh, for the, um, the ice age, ice cover melting uh, over the world. So 120 meters. Right now, the ice in Antarctica and Greenland together, if it were to melt, uh, would raise the global sea level about 80 meters. 
so two thirds of uh, what we have here. So there's still um, room for change. If you look at the last uh, hundred or so years, uh, what you see on the bottom is an overall series in black, and then three uh, tidal gauge series with their uncertainty, just to show you uh, what the variability is. And at the end, there's a red line, which is uh, the average sea level rise from satellite data. Um, they agree fairly well, and, and, and so we're pretty confident that, that uh, we are able to assess, um, we're able to, to measure something that that's, can be thought of as sea level rise. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their reports, uh, have a chapter on sea level rise. And sea level rise can basically be divided up into two major components. One that's due to uh, water getting warmer and therefore expanding, uh, and the other due to um, there being more water. Um, so when there's more water, that's from, from uh, typical from, from glaciers and, and Greenland melting, uh, to some extent Antarctica melting. Um, now the first one, the steric sea level rise, the one due to, to uh, warm, warmer water, is modeled in most of the models that are used in, in the IPCC analysis. And the latest model experiment was called CMIP-5. CMIP stands for um, uh, Climate Model Intercomparison Project. Um, and the fifth one of those. Um, so that had about 50 or so models that were run using the different scenarios and using historical data. Um, not all <laughs> models were run under all scenarios, uh, but um, you use what you can get. So in some sense, that's the best climate scientists can do today. Uh, the ice melt part is harder to model because glaciers are too small to show up in, in um, in climate models, and even Greenland isn't that many uh, grid squares. Uh, so the way the IPCC deals with that is they use temperature projections from their, um, from their models, and then they let those temperature projections drive <laughs> finer resolution ice melt models. And then the uncertainty is uh, assessed. And again, here I'm guessing, but it's a fairly informed guess, by a bunch of people sitting in the room and, and putting it down plus minus numbers. OK, I'm not terribly happy with that, because I would like to see exactly uh, how, I can, um, how I can do that. Um, so I'm doing things a slightly different way, and we'll see that I get very similar results. Now, there are three models in CMIP-5 in the, in the experiment that, that actually calculate sea level rise. It took us quite a while to find them, and when we looked at the data from one of them, it was all zero. So I don't think they actually calculated sea level rise. They just output that variable without doing anything about it. Um, two models is a little too little to, it's too few models to actually do any analysis for. So we're going to use something else which, which in the climate science literature is called a semi-empirical approach. I have no idea what's semi about it. It seems to me to be an empirical approach. Um, it was introduced by Ramsdorf in, in Germany and, and uh, tries to relate historical sea level change to historical temperatures. And his setup was 
basically um, the change in, in sea level um, is a linear combination of the change, the cumulative change in sea level, which is sort of deals with slow changes, and uh, change in, in, uh, in temperature. So those are rapid responses. Uh, now, oceans do not tend to report, respond rapidly to, to air temperature, although the top, top layer of, of the ocean can. Um, anyway, so this is, this is the model that Ramstorff wrote down. And um, you take that and you estimate the parameters. And it turns out that there is uh, a fairly reasonable A coefficient. The B coefficient is not. And so there is no evidence really that, that uh, we need uh, the rapid response in the model. And so we're not going to use it. Um, the error here is, is, is a time series error. And, and, and the whole thing is a time series regression. So that gives us a, a model for historical data. Now we want to see how we can use that um, to project temperatures. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our relationship, our A hat, and also there's, there was a T0 there, which is actually a parameter. It's, it's, it gives you basically the, the intercept or something relating to the, related to the intercept. And so you use those two parameters and, and um, plug projected temperatures into it. And so for each climate model, we are going to get its own curve that computes sea level. And the red lines here are, are, are those different curves. Um, there are some uh, dashed lines, which are point-wise confidence bands. And there are some dark lines, which are simultaneous confidence bands, based on a mixture model. Uh, so we treat each, each uh, climate model as a point in the mixture. It gives us a curve. And it's smooth because it's been integrated. Um, and then um, that also can give us a simultaneous confidence band, which is the solid black line. The blue line to the left, starting in 1950, is actually data. And you then wonder, how does the uh, IPCC results compared to our results, they are a little bit wider in terms of the uncertainty, but not much. Uh, just to be able to see it a little better, I'm going to take away the individual series, and we can just see that, that uh, um, they give very similar results. Now, if you look in the IPCC report, it does not say that they give very similar results. It's only the analysis that I and my colleagues did that gives it similar results. So why, why is that? Well, it turns out that the semi-empirical approach is extremely sensitive to what data set you use. If you update the data set, uh, you're going to get different, different answers. Um, so when you use Earlier data sets that were less precise, had fewer observations, and didn't go as far forward in time, you get much higher sea level rise. The or original approach used a smoother. There is some theory in, in, in applied mathematics that, that you should always use smoothers instead of, of the original series. For statisticians, that, that has not been something that we believed in. Um, 
and it turns out that it actually makes very little difference. So the fact that we integrate the, the temperature is, is enough of a smoother uh, that, that using a different smoother doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, Ramsdorf's group used to use the kind of strange ad hoc <coughs> approach to, to dealing with, with, with the time series. We use a standard um, uh, forecast package by him. Again, that made very little difference. What the main difference was the data set used and something that also affects how much water there is in the, in the ocean, and, and that's how much water is stored on land. Not just in, in glaciers, which we have a fairly good uh, understanding of, but also in, in cisterns and, and, and uh, other... Um, places where we keep drinking water. Now, of course, there's also water stored in, 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 in the groundwater, and, and changes in that are, are complicated. Um, the storage correction they used was just the curve fitting to a, to a single data set, and uh, we ended up not using that. If you use the storage correction, you get a much higher value of, of um, of sea level rise. Okay, so that deals with um, how you can project global sea level. Now what we need is actually uh, local sea level. We're going to look at the city of Bergen in Norway on the west coast. Uh, there's the harbor of Bergen on top, and those uh, beautiful buildings are a reconstruction of an old uh, set of buildings that burned down in the early 1800s um, that are actually the old Hansa city uh, of Bergen. It was part of the Hansa network of, of, uh, of uh, trading. So it's now a World Heritage Site and, and uh, should be protected from flooding. Um, but it isn't. It regularly floods whenever there's extreme tides. Uh, so that's a bit... That's something that the authorities in Bergen are concerned about and they, are, they have thought about different ways of dealing with um, with this. Now if you look at the, at the uh, map on the lower right, you see a uh, typical Norwegian landscape. You have the water coming in and you have very steep mountains on both sides. So sea level rise matters in the, in the low region and, and very quickly doesn't become important anymore, but the low region is where you have the World Heritage Site. So we're going to have to figure out how to compute from the global series uh, what's going to happen locally. Well, we could just use the global series, but that's not a good idea. And the reason is that local sea level is, is often different from, um, from global because um, it depends on how long ago the ice melted. And the ice over Bergen melted not that long ago and so there's still a, a ground, ground level rise the ground is rebounding from the fact that it had this huge uh, chunk of ice on top of it. When it melted, the land started slowly rebounding. It's a slow process. It's a process over tens of thousands of years. Um, it doesn't change very much, but you have to adjust for it. And we'll see how much in a, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> 
Another thing that affects uh, sea level is, is winds. So changes in winds affects where uh, you get high tides, where you get um, sea level surges and, and things like that. Um, changes in ocean currents can affect sea level rise. Um, and a few other things. Um, so, for example, gravitation affects sea level rise. Uh, if, if Greenland melts, sea level rise at Bergen goes down. Doesn't sound right, does it? But it has to do with gravitation. It changes the distribution of mass of the, of the Earth. And uh, if Antarctica, on the other hand, melts, then sea level at Bergen goes up. So we need understanding and, and good models for those, those processes. And, and uh, gravitational changes have actually been, been observed uh, in several places based on the melting of glaciers. They're not big, but they're important. OK, so here's, here's the Bergen uh, time series data goes back to 1920, and I've filled in a few years during the war where, where um, they didn't have um, observations weren't made properly, because the current government at the time didn't think it was important. Um, and um, it looks pretty flat, doesn't it? It's not much happening. There's, there's really no in substantial sea level rise. But remember the isostatic correction, the land rebound. How big is that? There's the land rebound, reasonably approximated by a straight line over, over 100 years, according to the geologist I've talked to. OK, so we need to correct. We need to correct the sea level rise, because it stayed flat, which meant that it, sea level rise must have gone up about as fast as the, as the isostatic correction did. And so when you correct, here's what you get. Now, there's some uncertainty in that, because there's uncertainty in how fast the land is rising. Um, but that's well understood and well measured. And of course, there's uncertainty in, in the measurements, the tidal measurements themselves, but that's also reasonably well understood. And so we can write down measurement error models for that. So instead of using the observed series now for a little while, I'm going to use the corrected series, and that's what I'm going to try to relate to the global sea level. So here's that relation. The corrected sea level uh, on the x-axis and the global sea level on the y-axis. And we have, a, we have a line going through that. It's... Uh, now, slope 1.3 with a standard error of 0.12. So we actually think that sea level at, at uh, Bergen is rising slightly faster than globally. Uh, the error structure there, again, is a time series, ARMA 1.1. OK, so now we have a way of relating locals sea level to the global sea level that we figured out how to project earlier. And so the model for sea level projections for Bergen then is going to use the global model. So this is global sea level, which is integrated uh, A hat times uh, change, slow change in, in um, in temperature, and this, the I here stands for model I, so I have, I have uh, some 40 models that, that do this. 
And um, and then the, the local sea level is going to be just related to the global projection. So, and B hat here is going to be 1.3 with epsilon normal 1, 1, so just that. And the uh, zetas on top are, are integrated uh, moving average errors. OK. So let's see what we get. Here's the local projection that we get. And now the blue line is, again, the actually observed data, not the corrected data because that's what we're trying to predict. So we've uncorrected um, in order to make this, this map. And you see the different models that give different results. Uh, you see the pointwise uh, standard errors is the dashed line, and the simultaneous ones is the solid line. Now, those are pretty wide, because they have lots of components in it. They have a component for for um, the global model, the global regression, they have a component for the, for the local regression, they have a component for the uh, isostatic correction, and a few other things. So, um, there's some uncertainty there. Now, IPCC produces a sea level a local sea level rise series at grid squares that are fairly big, so the grid square that contains Bag and also con contains several other Norwegian cities. Um, and they assume a constant isostatic correction over that region, which is not likely to be true. And as a result, they are much more optimistic about what's going to happen in Bergen than what I am. So these are both uh, the highest um, scenario, 8.5, um, because the Norwegian authorities have actually been convinced by scientists that sea level rise planning in Norway is supposed to be done based on the highest 90% confidence limit under scenario 8.5. So it's a fairly conservative, but if that happens, then, then that's what you need to do. And so this is the rule for all of Norway. It's, this is how it's supposed to be done. It took quite a while to get them to accept to use the upper uh, 95th percentile instead of the median like they wanted to. Um, and the scientists I talked to um, were very happy that they actually got that. Managed to convince the authorities that that was the right thing to do. Okay, now of course, mean sea level rise isn't what happens. What happens is, is disasters that are due to a whole bunch of things happening at the same time. So the worst ca case is you get a higher mean sea level. On top of that, you get a highest high tide, say. So that can be a, a distance of, of, of several meters. Tidal range in, in Bergen isn't that high. It's only about one and a half meters. So the highest high tide is going to be about 75 centimeters above um, the mean sea level rise. And then you can get a storm surge. And I just, Norway gets pretty ugly uh, storm surges coming in from the, from the, from the west. Um, I just saw today that uh, there were some observed uh, storm surges in the current um, hurricane in, in, in the Caribbean of seven meters. 
Now that's two, a two-story building that gets covered. That's a lot of water. Okay, so one would need to, of course, tide we can estimate fairly well. Uh, we can do an approximation using a, a sine curve that, that's fairly straightforward. Storm surge we can model using, using a generalized extreme value distribution and we have data that, that allows us to do that. Um, the location of that distribution will then depend on, on mean sea level and a research question is, is actually um, should any of the other parameters de depend on mean sea level and, and also is it reasonable that the storm surge distribution would, would change linearly uh, in terms of the location parameter? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a research problem if somebody wants one. Um, I don't know the answer. So far, the modeling. I've seen has been done assuming that it just increases linearly with, with mean sea level. I'm not absolutely sure that that's true. So, Okay. So that's sea level. And because that was my main part of the project, that has been the main part of this talk. But now let's go and think about the other aspects. So, There was a report by, by a consulting group um, done by, commissioned by, by the Bergen authorities um, that suggested two possible adaptation options. One was an outer barrier, which would co cost about 3.4 billion pounds, or 34 billion Norwegian crowns. Um, it would have four barriers. It would actually make um, shipping into Bergen Harbor somewhat difficult, and therefore, so you would have to have movable barriers, and, and uh, um, you would have substantial environmental and economic consequences. And it was quite expensive. So then they thought about something else to inner barriers, so barriers closer to to, to the harbor, um, they would be cheaper, about 113 million pounds, um, would have limited benefits, it wouldn't be as good as the outside barrier, it wouldn't cover as many possible ways that the water could come in. Um, so, just to get some numbers, we assume that uh, it would be, uh, would be protecting for about 50% of the damage at 75 centimeter sea level rise, which is one of the things we were looking at. Okay. Now, one needs to think about whether when you decide what you're going to build, uh, some kind of cost-benefit analysis is typically done in these kinds of decisions. Um, and so, um, which adaptation should we do? And if we decide to do adaptation, when would be the best time? And how much would it cost if we didn't do anything? Does it really matter? Uh, in terms of a, a budget that has many different priorities and many different uses for money. Another issue that, that's of interest is, is can we actually take into account the associated uncertainties? So I showed you the uncertainties for the sea level rise. There are also uncertainties for other things, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, 
So sea level rise is uncertain. Total yearly damage in each year is uncertain. But we have data on it. And the change in total yearly damage due to sea level rise. So I can, I can tell you on a typical year what the cost of sea level rise uh, is in, or a storm surge is in, in Bergen. Uh, but I can't tell you what's going to happen if the sea level rise, sea, if the sea level rises, because I don't have data on it, right? I have data on on on, on current effects, and, and so so that's what we're going to try to to deal with. Now we start with damage data. Uh, the Norwegian Natural Perils Pool has has a bunch of data. Um, uh, and here what we've done is we've joined the two neighboring counties to get a little bit more, little more observations. And we're fitting a bird distribution, uh, which is a very, very, very long tail distribution. Uh, if you set the parameters right, the Pareto distribution is a special case of this. Um, and so this uh, is a model now for county level storm surge damage data <coughs> in 2013 Norwegian crowns. And there's 10 Norwegian crowns to a pound. Um, and you see that the, the quantile quantile plot is pretty reasonable. On the other hand, it's very uncertain. The red lines here are 90% are confidence bands. Um, Simultaneous confidence bands. So I don't have a clue what it should look like in the tail, but this model isn't, um, you know, it's certainly not one that one could rule out. <coughs> so to get the effect of sea level change on damage cost, I have to start looking at, at, um, at other types of research. And there's a paper by Halligat and co-workers from 2013, where they look at, at some 130 um, coastal cities, 136 coastal cities worldwide. Um, what we look at here are fift the 15 European cities in that data set, including Ga Glasgow, incidentally, um, where the Sea level rise in Glasgow is measured is not clear to me, but it must be somewhere down the river. Um, anyway, so you see that there's this is this is so they do a model. They write down a model, an economic model that uh, that says that here is what's going to happen if sea level goes up 20 percent. Going to have a multiplicative factor. That's bigger than one in all the cities, although not much bigger than one. And if it goes up 40 centimeters, that's what we're going to have. Now, this is all the data we were able to find on modeling the change. Now, one could run this model in a more sophisticated mode, and, and uh, that will be down the line something that we need to talk to the authors about. Um, to see if one can get more uh, cities, more data. Uh, but again, it's a model. Uh, we are going to treat it as we're going to do what you're not supposed to do. We're going to draw a straight line. We're going to expand it by a straight line. We could expand it by an exponential function or, or whatever, but we have two observations. <laughs> Through two observations, you can draw only one line. And so we did that. So we're going to use that. We're going to use this as, a, as, a, as an ensemble of sea level rise cost increases. So we're going we're gonna to think of the uncertainty as, as the distance between these extreme lines. And, um, 
and see what we get. So then we're going to simulate damage costs from 2016 to, to 2100, because we had data up through 2015. And so we're going to simulate the time series of local mean sea level. It's easy to do. We have a time series model for that. Uh, for each year, we're going to draw independent costs at the 2015 uh, mean sea level, and then draw independent cost adjustments, so a multiplier that will be applied to the local mean sea level rise relative to 2015. And then we're going to use a discount rate, and we're using the discount rate that the Norwegian bank uh, suggested that we use. Okay, so that gives us some um, simulated costs. Okay, and they're going to be variable. Quite variable. So let me show you what it looks like. The first question is, when should you adapt? So, we're going to you can decide that based on, on lots of different things. Well, should you adapt at all? Uh, what would happen if the, we didn't do anything? Um, well, if we could, didn't do anything, then, then you know, we would have a cost every year, and, and uh, we would just um, play with that. Uh, this is the difference between the optimal median, which is the dark blue line, and um, well, let, me, let me draw just that. Uh, so you see around 2060, we would have the biggest difference between adaptation using these two things. The adaptation using the, the outer barrier is pointless because it's outside this graph. Well, nearly. 3.4 uh, billion. Um, it is not like, it is, sorry, 34 billion in, in Norwegian crowns. So it's outside the graph. Because this uh, y axis is in Norwegian crowns. So we should probably do something around 2060. And if we look at the upper 95 percent, upper 95th percentile, we might want to do things a little earlier, maybe as early as, as, as 2040, when that starts changing. But you see, there's immense uncertainty. These are 95 percent intervals of the, of the relative cost. If there was no sea level rise, this is how costs would go up. So the blue is the median, and the, the light blue is the uncertainty. That says no sea level rise at all. Costs would still go up because of discount. Um, now, if we do not adapt, here's what the median cost would be goes up to about one billion. Um, but could go as high as, as four and a half. Again, we have a 90% uh, confidence band because that's what IPCC always uses. And then if we adapt at 2059, which is the optimal year, um, we end up saving some 80,000, sorry, 80 million Norwegian crowns. So now the decision makers will have to decide, is that money that we can afford to throw away? Or do we, uh, do we actually want? So this is the median saving. Of course, the 95th, upper 95th percentile 
tells you a different story. It's, we're saving about a billion. And that's uh, quite a bit different. So if you're following the Norwegian authorities, you should look at the Apple. Now let's look at the components of uncertainty. So this is what a lot of reports actually would tell you. Um, they would tell you, they would do the median sea level rise, they would do the median cost, they would do the median correction factor, or the correction factor, median correction factor at the median sea level. Um, sea level rise. And that's what you would get. If you had a single number, no uncertainty, everything is very nice. How bad is that? Very bad. Here is taking into account the total uncertainty. The median now is a log scale on the bottom, so uh, the median now is, is uh, nearly 10 times higher. And even the lower 5% level is higher than using only medians in everything. You can also look at the individual components. So what we're doing here is we, we're looking at, at what happens if I hold the other two factors on the median and, and just vary sea level. You see, sea level is not very important. The multiplier is uncertain, but also not very important. And the cost is very important. The cost is really the, what drives the whole thing. And you get the same thing with, um, in the other scenarios. We've done the analysis for all the different scenarios. And the story is roughly the same. Um, it's more expensive under 8.5, but it's still the, the case that, that you really need to take into account the uncertainty when you do the analysis. Just a few things. This is what's called light touch decision making in that we have simplified everything uh, immensely. We could, for example, run a, a model. Um, we're only considering one aspect of the decision, namely how, how does sea level rise affect um, the cost of, of damage. Um, the advantage, I mean, the light touch is because we didn't have to do extensive modeling of exactly what's going on. We took existing things and, 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 and tried to see uh, back of the envelope type calculations, really. Um, but they give you an idea of where to go with these types of things. It may well be possible to improve the, the estimated of the multiplier by using more careful modeling of, of, uh, in the style of, of Halligat's model or other models that we don't know about yet. And then we would really like to relate damage costs to storm surges and to extensive precipitation. And uh, that's very far down the line. But it's somewhere we would need to go eventually. Let me leave you with some references, if you're interested. And that's all. So, um, thank you very much, Peter, for that um, very convincing talk through what's happening in terms of sea level rise, which is something that the city of Glasgow is also slightly concerned about. Um, now, we have time for some questions from the audience. We have some helpers around the sides with microphones, so if you could um, raise your hand if you have any questions, and uh, we can get started in that part of the session. Hi. Um, <clears throat> absolutely great talk, of course. Uh, just a quick question. Are you completely ignoring all possibilities of abrupt change, or do you have that in the back of your mind? The because possibility the of what? Abrupt. Uh, rapid and abrupt change. Well, you know, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, 
The most likely cause of abrupt change is, is rapid melting of Greenland's, Greenland's ice. Um, we are ignoring that. The IPCC is ignoring that. Not because we don't think it's going to happen, but because we don't have good models for it. It's, of course, Greenland is, is ice melting is, is, depends on a variety of things, warmer climate, warmer seawater, um, and ice mechanical things that, that I don't fully understand. Um, what we are assuming is that the rate of melt that both at, of all glacial melts taken together stays the same order of magnitude as it did during the last hundred years. Is that worse than assuming that we have a scenario that, that says what the, what the emissions are going to be? I don't know. We have to, we have to do something and, and uh, we don't really know how to model uh, abrupt changes. So we have not taken them into account. One could, of course, put in a Poisson model there and, and with an increasing rate, but we would have to estimate that from data. And, and, and it's while there are starting to be really good data on, on, on the Greenland melt collected by the, by the Danish Meteorological Society, there's not enough of it yet to draw that kind of, to build that kind of models. But a very good question. So, so you've tried to answer the question of um, when do we adapt, but maybe a more realistic question is when do we make the decision to adapt? Because issues like the, the cost of, of sort of the sea level rise is something where the uncertainty of it will change over time as we, you know, have more information, for example. So, 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 so would, would that be an analysis that, that's doable? Sense. You're quite right. Um, so, what we assumed was that they would make a decision now and wanted to know just when should we build this thing. We're going to set aside money to build it or start setting aside money to build it and we're going to make that decision today. If they make the decision later, we would have to change the amount of money they, they set aside. And we can do that modeling as well. Uh, we just haven't done it. This was, this was sort of the first uh, stab at it. And, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, modeling how decision makers make decisions is a different issue that we have not <laughs> dealt with. And it's hard and it's important. But you have to start somewhere to get some answers. Um, the sea level projection is heavily depend on temperature projection. So have you looked at the temperature model? Have you tried many different models? How you are sure about the temperature projection? Well, first of all, it's a projection. So it's, it's based on assumptions about the future that I have no way of checking until the future happens. Um, the temperature models, I think, annual temperature is probably one of the parameters in a climate model that's best um, established. It's the one that's always compared to data um, when you do a historical run. Um, now, one of the things we've been thinking about is, is to look at how well a model did on a historical run and wait, instead of we, we were actually weighting our, our different climate models equally, we could weight them according to how well they did uh, on historical data. Um, and that works if we're only looking at temperature, which we are in this case, we start looking at precipitation as well, then we would probably have, diff or very likely have different models 
that are the best for precipitation than the models that are the best for, for temperature. And so, um, as always, the answer is it's complicated. Sorry, it's a, it's a very simple question. In your projections of uh, sea levels for Bergen, the, the, you seem to have um, assumed that the land has stopped rising. Uh, have I read that correctly? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking that into account and I'm correcting, I'm correcting the, uh, the observed sea level rise series with uh, land rise, for land rise relating that to um, global sea level and then back transforming so that I'm, I'm actually modeling observed sea level rise and not corrected sea level rise. So I'm um, afraid that has, has come to the end of this particular session, um, but I hope you would like to join with me in thanking Peter for this very fascinating talk into sea level rise projections and their implications, but also congratulating him on this year's award of the Barnet Lecture. So, congratulations.